Okay, um, uh, the difference between ek and ex. Um, I've been noticing the pattern of ek precedes a consonant and ex precedes a vowel. And I haven't seen oh. anything yet that contradicts that. That's cool. A lot of languages do that. Okay. Uh, uh, Amer uh, English does that with a, a gun and um, an apocalypse. Yeah. You know, the A and an, and Italian does it with a an and ed. Oh. So that's not that unusual. Yeah. One, every single ek I have seen has preceded a consonant, and every single x I've seen precedes a vowel. You, you're, you're what we call a, uh, in the computer science world a, a person who can recognize patterns. That, well, that's what language is. It's pattern. Yeah, it is. And you're finding things that even I haven't, I haven't seen. Oh, goodness. Okay. So I'm really impressed. You know, so we have, it's important, is the patterns of how you can tell something is past tense. And right. what about the ideas of two vowels and one dropping out? Right. Uh, well, you know, Russian seeing... does that. It's called a fleeting vowel. There's a name for it? There's a name for it. <laughs> fleeting vowel. Oh. Yeah, it's running away. Ah, uh -oh, uh -oh. Yeah. So that's, it's a possibility. Um, I just kind of thumbed through the Greek Bible and just the ones that I could uh, find on the fly, and all of them followed that pattern. So that might be it. Cool. That's great. Thank you. And that yeah, means you bought, you bought yourself a Greek Bible then, huh? Oh, yes. Okay. I'm finding myself being fascinated by this language. dictionary now oh yay congratulations that's the thin one right well it's a little thicker it's a thin one oh uh, that's it yeah it's a red cover so that's what i'm used to seeing deutsche bibelgesellschaft um earlier uh patricia was telling me she just bought herself a greek new testament so it's now in her possession and she is having a blast going through it <laughs> so this is about the time that you should uh, uh, purchase a uh, Greek New Testament if you haven't already. One is just the Greek, but it's Deutsche Gesell Gesellschaft who's publishing it. Yes. That's the one I have. Uh, and this is an interlinear with Tyndale. Oh, cool. That's, that's very nice. Um, this, the, um, the first one I showed you has the apparatus which apparatus you know, like, is the what i call the footnotes yes it's the stuff at the bottom that helps say which documents did this translate uh, this version come from not that i have looked at them in months or years even oh i'm <laughs> always down in the in the apparatus i'm always digging around in there <laughs> yeah good good <laughs> Um, do you think it'd be worth it to get a Septuagint? Um, uh, you wanted to talk, read about the early church fathers, if I remember. And so yeah. for you, yes. Uh, for most people, no. Okay. Uh, the, the, uh, the early church uh, tended to use the Septuagint, and it worked its way into the Alexandrian um, uh, version, the Greek Bible, the Septuagint uh, is the Old Testament uh, from Hebrew. So um, if you're going into the Old Testament, I would recommend learning Hebrew. If you want to find out why uh, the early church uh, translated certain uh, Old Testament passages the way they did, then yes, you would need the Septuagint to uh, figure that out. Actually, you can access it online. Um, I have a copy of the Septuagint uh, that I commonly look at because uh, I want to know what the Greek has, and it, it, it reveals some very interesting and surprising things. Yep. It's, it's probably now going to be 25 or $30. Oh, that's cheap. What a yeah, bargain. Not, not, not that bad, not that yeah. bad, but I use it often. Yeah. I use it often. It's very... You know, if you're going to be a Bible expositionary kind of preacher, teacher like I am, it comes in very handy.
Here's a copy of the Septuagint in Greek and then gives it English, um, published got... by, by Zondervan. Okay. Zondervan. Wow, I guess I'm going to have to buy a copy. I think I can afford 30 bucks. <laughs> Another book that's worth uh, buying, uh, Tony, especially for early church fathers, is the Apocrypha, uh, published by Oxford. Let us go into uh, verbs and tenses. That's what you're here for. You wanted to know about, are there other, you know, uh, how can I tell what words mean in terms of time and state? And that's what I say this till almost last because it would be an introduction going into a seminary course in Greek. Uh, so what I did is I went through my books and found all the tables and put them together. And I, that's when you can see patterns. When they try to teach it in seminary, they'll put one table and you won't see the, any of the others until 40 pages later. And oh, there's another table. And it never dawns on you to kind of put them together to say, oh, I see the pattern. And that's what Patricia was looking at. There are patterns. And when you see the patterns, you go, ah, it's not uh, as so daunting as, as it first appears. Okay. There are 288 different endings for regular verbs. Uh, not, a, not a particular verb doesn't have 288 uh, different endings, but when you look at all of the regular verbs that are there uh, and you start doing some multiplication, each word can have 12 different tense options. This is kind of an English, um, I have a table coming up that shows this. There are 12 tense, tense options uh, times six declensions for each verb. So it's, I did this, you did this, he did that. And then there's four common verb endings. And these are the ah, oh, eh, oh, 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 and ooh, oh. Well, if you multiply these out, that's 288 different endings that you have to become familiar with. Um, uh, daunting for the beginner. But fortunately, so much of the New Testament is in past tense and a certain style of past tense, you'll start seeing uh, commonalities. And after a while, uh, it's like, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Uh, it's just a verb. It's past tense. Move on. Nothing to see here. But uh, yea and verily, if you're trying to uh, make a grade in a uh, uh, in a uh, seminary course. Uh, this is definitely a uh, a shock to most students. Uh, we uh, in these tables. I'm going to use the most common word that you'll find in classes. It's luo, meaning I loose. It's only two letters, L U and omega. Uh, I loose and by just having those two letters, then you'll be able to see the patterns uh, rather than trying to put a great big long uh, verb uh, as my example. I'll just use the one that everybody else uses, which is luo. Um, so if I'm uh, uh, presently loosing something, I'm untying a shoe or loosing a colt uh, to bring to Jesus, it's just luo, I loose. Uh, but if I've already done it and it's in the past, uh, just as I've been mentioning over weeks and weeks, introducing you to the pattern of an epsilon in front uh, tells you, oh, this is a, a past tense form of loosing. And we've also noticed uh, in our examples where the eta uh, is also a form of past tense. So if you've got a stem, lu, and you've got an epsilon or an eta in front of it, um, that's, that's the standard signal that I've been saying all along. Uh, now I'm gonna kind of show wh why that is so. So, uh, so roots that don't end in a, uh, in a vowel, um, 
follow the Luo endings. Uh, these are what we call regular verbs, and they're going to follow a pattern. So balo and grafo are going to follow the same pattern you find in luo. So all you have to do is really start uh, memorizing and remembering the endings for luo, and you've got quite a bit of other uh, uh, verbs in your pocket because you're just simply swatching, swapping out ba for lu or graf for lu. Then you've got a whole set of irregular verbs and this page after page after page in, in, the, in the Greek uh, grammar courses uh, of all these irregular verses, uh, uh, verbs and you have um, tables after tables after tables and uh, I haven't found any patterns. Uh, quite literally, it's just brute memory work when you find an irregular verb and yet you, you have to uh, just go to the book and say, okay, this is an irregular, is this a blue perfect? Is this a uh, errorist? Is it a past, you know, is it present? Is it future? You know, regular verbs, fairly easy to figure out. Irregular verbs, very difficult. So I want to introduce you to what I call the stutter tense. Um, they visually appear as if I'm stuttering, I'm repeating the first syllable. And so when the verb repeats the first consonant, it's called reduplication. And it's as if someone has stuttered. Uh, it's an action that tells you it's in the past and something else occurred at the same time. So, when you translate these stutter words, you can insert a helper word like, while Jesus was walking, the blind man spoke. Or uh, when Jesus did such and such, uh, the crowds came to him. So you've got a, a, a while or a when activity, and then something else is happening at the same time. It appears many times in the narratives. Um, I don't want you to be worried in this class to, to become an expert in it. But if you are going to on to a Greek seminary course, uh, you will need to uh, uh, know about these in great detail. Uh, this comic strip was produced while I was taking the class. My wife found it and said, did this is something that looks like you? And I go, yeah, that's me. You know, English, I know English, you know, Greek. I know Greek, let me help. And, and they start throwing things like imperatives and reflexives and imperfect subjunctives and pluperfects and, and errors tense. And you're going, ah! And um, uh, you thought, oh, I just thought this was English homework. Yeah. <laughs> now, if you are an English major or a, a grammatician, you know what all these are. But for someone who's, a, I'm a computer science geek, you know, I'm coming into it, this language, and I don't even know my own English grammar. So part of taking Greek was to teach me what, what my own native tongue was. One form is called present active. One form of the stutter tense is says, I'm telling you the story as if you were there at the time. So it has a sense of, um, a flashback when you're brought into the movie uh, to uh, see a, a previous episode, a uh, previous scene in, in, in the life. So it says, um, I'm telling you uh, this event uh, as if you were still there at the time. Uh, in our uh, Acts case, we had Peter recounting what had happened in uh, Cornelius's house previously, he's now back in Jerusalem, and he's reporting using this kind of um, uh, present active tense. He's, he's saying, uh, this is what it was like, and, he's, and he starts replaying the conversations to the, to the rest of the church uh, as if they were there. So um, uh, that would be fine, except there are exceptions, and here's an exception. This is that funny um, irregular word uh, for pipto, which means I fall. And 
just on first blush, you'd say, oh, look, it looks like a reduplication. There's a duplication there. But in fact, this particular word is not reduplication. It's just a simple past tense. Um, it's the epsilon in front, the root, pipto, and then sen is also another clue that you've got past tense. Uh, we tend to want to change it to English and put a while helper verb, you know, while uh, uh, Peter was talking, the Holy Spirit fell upon them. Uh, but that's not carried by this word. This word doesn't carry that while sense. It's, um, it's just simply uh, Peter's talking, new concept, Holy Spirit fell on, past tense. Another form is what's called um, passive, perfect passive. So perfect as means perfected. It's like it's past tense. Perfect passive says this event is a done deal. In other words, it's not still going on. But at the time, let me tell you what happened. Um, we have a, another uh, uh, weird case also in Acts 10 of la luantas. And it would be real easy to say, oh, look, there's reduplication, you know, two L's in a row. But in fact, it's from la leo, which is I speak. Uh, when you turn it into English, you still or may want to put some helper words in there, when spoken or while speaking. But in fact, uh, this is not reduplication. This, so I just offer these two that it's real easy to say, oh, I've learned all about reduplication, and then, then try to you know, put a square peg in a round hole. So I just use these two as examples of that it's not always as it appears. Okay. This is all in English. There's no Greek here. Uh, but it's uh, from elements of New Testament Greek. Uh, I just stole it directly out of the document. And uh, what I've learned uh, was that English is very concerned about time. Is it in the past, is it in the present, and in the future? Greek, on the other hand, is more concerned about the state. When you marry these two, in the English and the Greek, you get 12 different tense styles. And here's an example of just the word, I, I love is present simple. Past simple is I loved. That's how you normally would write it in English. Uh, future simple is I shall love. I don't love now, but I shall love. <laughs> um, continuous is, let's start always with the present. I am loving. I'm loving right now. Uh, future, I shall be loving, ongoing, as opposed to, you know, one time I shall love to eat ice cream uh, some future time, but I shall continue to love eating ice cream would be future continuous. Uh, imperfect uh, continuous is I used to love, uh, or I was loving, and there's a sense that it's kind of come to an end. I was loving ice cream, but now I enjoy pickles or something like that, right? So I did not do well in English when I went to school. And this still, uh, a chart like this still baffles me how, how um, fine the shades of meanings are. So I'm hoping that these English words help. Um, pluperfect is, uh, it's definitely a uh, ending. Uh, I had loved. Back then, I had loved. Uh, perfect, uh, present perfect says, I have loved. Uh, and I've I'm done. I'm finished up. I've, I've, I loved. I'm done. Um, and, and, but I did it currently. This is a while time back. I'm doing it currently. And uh, in the future says, um, I shall have loved. You get the sense that uh, in the New Testament, you're not going to get too many future tenses. And so I will concentrate on past and 
present. But for completeness sake, these are the 12. Uh, continuous complete is uh, uh, as opposed to just I had love, which means point in time. Pluto perfect continuous means uh, it's been ongoing and now I've finished loving. You know, I had been loving uh, both uh, distant past and into recent past, but now it's stopped. Uh, perfect continuous says, I have been loving. I'm not telling you when I started loving, but I'm still loving right now. And this is, to me, I can't imagine a, a sentence where this is involved, but a future perfect continuous says, um, I shall have been loving. <laughs> It's only you want to put a when in there. Uh, when I get old and 64, uh, I shall have been a loving person because I grew old and wiser. You know, it's, you know, it's uh, if you're trying to uh, slice and dice Greek this fine, uh, this class will not solve it. This is a this is a gram, uh, this is the type of work you'll be doing in a grammar course. Um, but these are the 12 different tenses. Um, now I'm color coding green, rose, purple, and orange here uh, to help uh, cross map to the tables that are coming up. And they tend to be from the Greek's point of view. Uh, so uh, it, is it present? Uh, it could be um, simple or it might be ongoing. Uh, or is it, or is it complete? In which case, it was like a one-time complete, or there was a long period of time, and now it's complete. But this is all green, so let's go back up and and um, so green is either present simple or present continuous. So luo, for instance. Uh, could be, I am loosing or I loose. Uh, and the Greek really doesn't care. Uh, it's kind of like a ha what I call a happening now tense. It won't tell you whether the action might continue or, or it might stop. So case one and two in the above chart get smooshed together in Greek. Uh, so it, it's, it's definitely active. And it's definitely present. And, uh, and so these are the endings of this. Uh, here are the six different declensions. I, you, he, we, y'all, they. And so L-U, Lu uh, is common throughout. Lu, Lu, Lu. And here are the common endings. O. Uh, I am doing something. Ice, uh, you are doing something. I without the S is he is doing something. Amen uh, is we are uh, doing something. And we've seen lots of words with amen in it. Uh, ete as an ending is uh, uh, you all, you guys out there, you're doing it. And usi or usen as an ending says they are loosing. So <clears throat> six declensions uh, for this one verb. And now I'm going to uh, start amping it up, showing you uh, what happens when you change uh, tense structure. So this was happening now. This is very active. This is what uh, you, uh, what everyone learns in their beginning Greek classes. That's on page 25. 70 pages later, you finally get the, <laughs> the other chart. So now having both on the same page, look at the comparison here. This is a once in the past tense. Uh, and so this is the orange, which would be whoop, this one right here, past simple, loved. And <clears throat> they put the epsilon in front, as you are uh, very familiar with by now. 
and they'll put an argument, an S-A, a sigma alpha. So elusa is I loosed, past tense. Uh, I didn't emphasize the endings to you. I just kind of pointed out the epsilon to you. And as a result, most of you could easily tell that it was past tense. And here is the declensions for those six. Sa, sas. Notice here the S ending, an S ending. Uh, se or sen. There's no correlation between the two there. Um, Samen, there is a linkage, M-E-N, M-E-N, but instead of an Omicron, they put the letter Sa, so Samen, Amen, uh, we loosed. Sa instead of the Epsilon, so Sate, Ette, uh, you all are loosing, you all loosed. Uh, this one doesn't match as well, but just simply san, they loose, past tense. And you'll see this, this one uh, very common. You'll see this one common. Uh, you'll see O, of course, a lot, and you'll see ice. So, uh, but this entire table is what's called arrowist. Uh, it just means uh, it's once in the past. Notice the lose all the way through. So we don't, we never lose the stem. The stem is always there uh, and with an epsilon in front. All right, now there's two, what I call way back when tenses. Uh, that's uh, numbered to the above chart, which is four and five or six and seven. Let me run up there. So, Four and five is present tense. Uh, six and seven are past tense. And um, they, they run together as, as follows. For the a stutter, they put a, uh, uh, the first uh, consonant, so lu, L-U, they take the L and stick it in front. This is this reduplication. So, it's the epsilon that you've seen before with an L in front of it. Let's go back up here. Ah. So here's an epsilon, LU, and an SA, S, uh, sigma alpha. Look what happens down here. Instead of a sigma, it's a K, ka. Mm -hmm. So it's instead of elusa, it's le lu ka. And it, what's what we uh, what we call an augment. So under just um, uh, plain past tense, it's sa. The augment is a sa uh, in this way back when of a tense. It's got a ka. So lu is all the way through. So we we don't lose our stem. L e in front is a clue that this is this reduplication. Um, and so instead of uh, uh, sa and sas and sen, it's ka and kas and ken. Essentially, it's really, let's, let's go up and double check that, that it's just a k for an a, a k for an s. Yep, and here they are. So common, kate, kan. There they are, common, kate, and now this one is kasen. This is slightly different, but it's still, in fact, it's more like, let me go back up there. It's more like this one up here, this plural. There's the usen, kasen. So it's not an exact pattern match, but you start to see some patterns like common, samen, kate, sate. And then the epsilon sitting here is past tense, and then reduplication takes the first letter of the of the stem and shoves it in front. So that's stutter perfect, stutter pluperfect, which means it's in uh, completed in the past. Uh, sometimes, not always, has an epsilon in front. So it's like. It's almost redundant. It's like 
here is a, uh, a past tense word. Oh, L-E. Oh, it's past tense. It's past past tense. <laughs> you know, it's, it's really kind of reemphasizing. So sometimes you'll see the epsilon and sometimes you won't. How do you tell them apart? The ending. So instead of a ka, it's cane. Instead of kas, it's kais and kai. Now, I'm going to go up to the, uh, the uh, present tense and look at these. So this is kain, kais, and kai. Ice and kai. So imagine just sticking a K in front of that and a K in front of that. And um, so the what's being added here is a K E I, kappa, epsilon, iota, all the way through. So if you find a stem and it's got a K E I in it, you go, ah, I know, it's a blue perfect. And so you run to this table and find out which declension it is. Is it I, you, he, uh, uh, we, you all, or they? Um, but the key is this uh, augment is K-I-E. Over here, the augment is K-A, and the augment uh, in the previous table was S-A. So these augments help you know uh, what kind of uh, 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 table you need to run to. Um, the happening now tense has no augments, but once in the past has a saw, a, a um, way back when um, perfect has a ka, and a way back when flu perfect has a chi with an optional epsilon in front of it. I believe that in the New Testament, you're going to mostly be in the uh, color section here. So it's mostly recognizing the augments. You have the uh, four regular first person, a o a o o o and u o. Yes. Uh, how does that affect these endings? We've seen books that uh, Katie has. We've seen books that uh, uh, Pat has uh, purchased and also Maura. So I want to use uh, describe some of the terms that those books are talking about. When they just talk about a portion, just think of it as a rolled up scroll. It's some portion of the New Testament that you could hold in your hand. Um, it wouldn't be the entire text. It would might be just the letters of Paul or it might be just the book of Revelation. In the front part of the uh, UBS New Testament and in the apparatus, which are the footnotes, uh, they are usually referencing, when they reference a portion, it's an, a complete portion. It's a complete portion of Paul's letter or a complete portion of Revelation or a complete portion of the book of Acts rather than scraps. Uh, the coding UBS United Bible Societies, UBS, Nestle Arland, N-A, uh, when you're uh, looking 
and someone is quoting something and they throw the string of letters, that's all they're doing. They're just, it's just the shorthand for this particular version uh, of, of the two documents. And they kind of run in sync, but not always. Uh, so we are, uh, they're currently working on Nestle Ireland 29. And what, uh, here's an uh, example, the difference between 27 and 26, you go, well, why should I buy a new copy of, of, the, of the Greek New Testament? Mine is still good enough. And that's usually the case, unless you are a scholar and you really want to know the latest stuff. And what's the difference between these two is it was a full review of all the footnotes. All the apparatus was fully reviewed from 26. And so when it became NA 27, none of the text in the Bible itself changed. Only the footnotes were reviewed. Um, and why do they do this? Well, there's thousands of fragments. And when they find a new fragment of a new archaeological dig, uh, especially if it's uh, in a very dry area that has preserved these old um, uh, parchments or these old um, papyri, uh, parchment being um, uh, animal skins and papyri being um, uh, uh, plant fiber, uh, and the dry desert climates tend to uh, preserve those. When they find those, then they say, oh, hey, where does this fit in? And that's where you get the, the updates. There's a new archeological find, they research it, they start mixing and matching. And then before you know it, you have Nestle Ireland 29. <laughs> um, but uh, indeed, if you're looking just or uh, learning how to read the Greek New Testament, uh, the changes are going to be really uh, minor and nominal, and I'll explain that in just a second. The Nestle Arland, uh, two uh, guys that uh, early developed uh, the uh, text, New Testament text from uh, the papyri and the, uh, the other fragments, and they're so well known, everything N.A. just refers to them. Right, right. And so Nestle uh, uh, had a, such a, a, a document put out in 1904. And if you want to call it NA1, that'll do. It'll work. That's really, it was his first attempt. And uh, it reflected archaeology. Up to that point, it was all Indiana Jones and treasure hunting. And so then they would find these scrolls and it's like, huh, that's not, that's not an answer. I want, I want a piece of gold or I want a statue or something or, you know, something chiseled in rock, you know. So a lot of these scrolls uh, weren't uh, a provenance properly and it made dating them really difficult. Modern archaeology is, is obsessive now. If they find uh, a, 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 a document They'll tell you what uh, layer in the dirt it was found in and what, how it was dated based on the pottery that's nearby. So new archaeological finds uh, are, um, are, are dated quite well. Uh, some of the old uninteresting, quote, quote, uh, scrolls uh, that we had, sometimes the best we can do is we say it's sometime in the fourth century, sometime in the third century, sometime in the sixth century. Uh, so the NA series, Nestle Arlen, uh, uh, will identify stuff that's been found since the last edition. So they'll say, here's all the numbered uh, papyri that, uh, that we knew about, and oh, and here's the new stuff. That, and so uh, if for the scholar, you can say, oh, well, where is that? Oh, it's in Berlin. I'm going to go fly to Berlin and see that. Or it's at the British Museum or it's in Pennsylvania somewhere. So uh, they, they, you can find these, uh, these archeological digs, these uh, documents from archeological digs. Uh, <clears throat> if a new find is quite literally a scrap, it's not a full roll, uh, it might be a chapter or just a few verses, it'll be checked against what's called the majority text. Um, and I'll define that shortly. If it adds nothing new, then the scrap gets numbered 
out of the 10,000 or so such fragments that exist, but it, uh, it is not treated with as high a value as a complete portion. If I have a scroll that has all of the book of Revelation and I find a scrap that has you know, three verses on it uh, and, I, and I don't know anything about the dating, let's say it was not provenance properly, I'm gonna go with the scroll and that's, that's what they've done. So what is this majority text? Uh, uh, it's where the majority of the complete portions, majority being 2,560 of them, as of Nestle Arlen uh, 25, and they've, it says, of all of these portions of, let's say, Paul's letters, uh, the majority of them uh, make the passages thus and so. But they're variants. And those variants appear in the apparatus, or what I've been calling the footnotes. Uh, a classic example is the last chapter of the Gospel of Mark. It's, if you turn open your Greek New Testament, you won't find that chapter in the, in, in the text. And you go, oh no, they're hiding something from me. But it's not really omitted, because if you go down to the footnotes, uh, they'll say, Go read the, uh, the last chapter on this page. You know? <laughs> so, so it's in there, you, uh, but you have to use the footnotes to go find it. Um, the idea of hiding truth has always uh, uh, caused me a bit of humor because it conflicts with the meaning of the word majority. So if I have 2,000 copies of of a passage and it spells sun as weos, and I have 150 copies that spell it as we, what am I to do? Well, you would put weos in the uh, text uh, of the Greek New Testament, and then in the footnote you would say uh, its alternate is spelling is we, and, uh, and, and these are the most common uh, documents which show we, and then you can say, oh, okay. And then if it's an issue, then uh, you might want to go research that particular um, edition of the Greek New Testament. You know, it might be something from Leningrad, or it might be something from Syria, or it might be some, some other Byzantine uh, document. And if uh, the word spelling uh, is important in a particular passage to you, the footnotes will tell you where you can do further research. Okay, so on the other hand, if I uh, just want a pedestrian reading of the Greek, uh, the 2,000 copies that spell sun as we us is going to be good enough for me. We are literally drowning in, in, in copies as opposed to any other Greek or Roman author, uh, Ripides, Pliny the Younger, uh, Plato, Aristotle, you know, we have, you know, dozens. Uh, in the New Testament, we have thousands. So uh, what we have found as the NAs go from NA uh, 30 to, uh, pardon me, NA 20 to 21 to 22, 23, 24, is that uh, there's not, it's exceedingly rare that anything new that's found in archeology span is gonna overrule the majority text. And that's why I said early in this class, you have uh, like a 98% uh, confidence level that what you have in your Greek New Testament is indeed as close to the original autograph as possible. And I was saying that because it is the majority text. It's the 2,000 out of the 2,560 that say we us instead of we. Okay. Uh, let me wrap up quickly here. Byzantine is just uh, means Eastern Roman Empire. And uh, the Eastern Orthodox branch of the Christian faith uh, uses the Syriac language, which is a, 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 a Eastern version of Greek. And 
uh, if you're trying to look at such a document and it's called out in the uh, footnotes as Syriac, it may or may not affect your translation. Once again, if it's something that's important to you, you know, oh, I need to go get a copy of a Syriac version from my Eastern Orthodox friends and say, can I borrow your Syriac uh, Greek Bible so I can cross check a particular verse? Okay. Texas Receptus is the common uh, scholarly shorthand for uh, the Greek text that Erasmus used and that later the King James uh, translation team used in 1611. Um, people want to kind of badmouth the King James, but I, after I've been doing this Greek class, I have discovered that they did a really good job. They uh, added words to the text to expose the meaning. So they did do some uh, minor interpretation, but they would italicize those words in most editions. So if you find italics in a King James Bible, it's not that they're trying to draw attention to it. They're just saying that this is a word that the translation team put in to make the English uh, readable. And I, I found that they chose with great care with the Greek uh, sources that they had available to them in the 1600s. Uh, then the next uh, and the last one is Westcott and Hork. Um, so commonly, you'll see it as just simply WH, but these are two gentlemen in the 1800s that started grabbing all this archaeological finds and putting them into uh, text, trying to find out which text uh, would be the uh, closest to the autograph uh, original autograph as possible, and they came up with four different ones. Um, Byzantine, they said it's still a little bit too modern. It doesn't get back to the old original Greek. Western uh, was indeed older, but it tended to be a lot of paraphrasing uh, rather than word for word, so it lacked dependability. And then there was the Alexandrian type. Alexandria was like the scholar's uh, center of the world in Egypt, for Greek, and it's very highly polished Greek. So they identified their favorite type called neutral, and their two fourth century uh, documents, Codex Vaticanus and Codex Sinaiticus. I can't even say that right, Sinaiticus, from Sinai, there we go. And um, these two documents uh, are the ones that are uh, the core that show up in your Nestle Arlen. Thank you.